Our next speaker is the governor of Nayarit, Mexico. Please welcome Antonio Echevarria Garcia. Channel one, English, please. Yes, yeah, sorry. Nayarit. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. I am honored on this biggest distinction for Nayarit, Mexico, to be a part of this major summit here in the UN headquarters. A place where you can breathe in peace. We are gathered here by the most basic and intrinsic rights for a man, their rights and their freedom. I hope we can always get together to look to strive for guaranteeing human rights. For doing so is the enormous and the biggest respect we owe to each other as human beings. I salute Ms. Mary Shuttleworth, founder and president of, human right, of Youth for Human Rights International. Ladies and gentlemen, youth delegates, I come from Nayarit, a spot within the Mexican Republic located over 4,000 kilometers away from New York. And I address you in representation of one 0.800 million young people that every single day get together in looking for a better place to live in. About a year ago, in Nayarit, we have a moment of anguish and we were saddened. But those days are finally over because every single day human rights were violated from the most highest government sphere regardless of what the consequences may be, without showing any remorse or any other action. Thanks to our citizens, we were able to bring back dignity to our government officials so that they could fix the path that they have diverged from. Now, our institutions that were used as aggressors of human rights, that they were used in order to perform some crimes, and now, we have already seek the responsible ones, and they are facing punishment. I strongly believe that those who respect freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of gathering, and any other action that involves a human being, it's bound to be exemplary and dignified, as it's a way of guaranteeing freedom of expression in its utmost ex in, the, in its utmost level. As a result, we have gathered all our citizens to follow the UN Agenda 2030, who has allowed our government to become a pioneer to create an agenda specifically based on human rights, which has already been part of the major agenda for my government from my time from 2017 to 2021. I guarantee that human rights and equality have become a new public policy for my state. I agree that it has been a major challenge to be faced. My country was extremely behind, specifically in this field of human rights. We've always faced, as a big enemy, the very president himself and any other government power. But what we really matter is what we do and what motivates us to do so our honest commitment to just causes, which is a major breakthrough so that we can start better the people's condition. In Nayarit, we are driven by the youth who are also driven to fight for social changes. Our youth today will help us build the future of Nayarit that is so needed and so deserved. This way, we get to guarantee human rights because no change 
is doable without any freedom. And freedom should be guaranteed through the 30 human rights as established in the Universal Declaration for Human Rights. We, should, we have to be objective. We should recognize that we have a long path to walk. And even though our efforts have been made, we are not there, we're not there yet. Even though the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights has not assessed us properly yet, we know we are on our way to change that. We recognize that, unfortunately, the structure of our country who does not allow this to be guaranteed, the Inter-American Commission definitely points at us as a weak point that we cannot guarantee the validity of these rights as of today. However, different levels of government have committed to change that around. And we should begin at least to recognize the problem, to observe it, and to provide a solution that has been neglected for so many years, that is directly connected to corruption and all the impunity that my country has faced for several years. Again, our actions will speak for ourselves. That's why we have created an institution to look for missing people through the commission of um, missing people. We have also published public policy to properly support and address people who were victim of slavery, backed up by international organizations, like the International Migration Organization. We also provide for a program that can help human rights in our local district, Nayarit. Our objective is to raise awareness and to guarantee the necessary tools for those who need to take action upon this matter. With you, the youth around us, we want to continue to push public policy, public lobbying, and all type of tasks and any activities might bring, that may bring us together as a team so that we can keep focusing on how Nayarit, in terms of human rights promotion, can do. Gratitude has always been a deep embedded value. And I would like to express so for those of you who are members of human, Youth for Human Rights International for giving me the materials with very simple but very powerful messages of what human rights are. And not only are they simple, but they also reach the youth's heart. About a year ago, we began to work with you, Youth for Human Rights Mexico. And we got a great social response, not only in promoting the 30 human rights, but also promo promoting tolerance and peace. That's a lot. It's more of what we have done in the past 30 years, what we have achieved in the past two years. So definitely, we are sure that we want to walk this path hand by hand and side by side by you, but also supporting our youth's intelligence. My eternal gratitude for your help and for the opportunity to address you on behalf of my people. This event definitely shows that there's a world out there with human beings that are good and that are seeking to guarantee human rights. Thank you. Muchas gracias. And we have an award for Ms. Shuttleworth. No la necesito. That was so beautiful, sir. Thank you so much. Wow. Muchas gracias, señor. Qué bellas palabras. From Mexico, also, Luis Raul González Pérez, the President, National Commission of Human Rights.
Muy buenas tardes, tengan todas y todos ustedes. Muy distinguida. Good afternoon, dear Miss Shuttleworth. Thank you so much for this invitation so that I could come and so that the Commission of Human Rights for Mexico could be here. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be able to talk to you and take this opportunity to delve on the importance of education and the direct link they share between peace and human rights, as well as the role that youth can perform in their strengthening. Peace, it's necessary so that the other human rights can take place. Violence, on the other hand, takes another toll on human dignity. Peace goes go, must go past a simple idea. It has to become a reality that actually brings relief and peace for everyone. Peace is something that simply transcends the definition of absence of war. For it also means absence of violence. We all have the right to develop our lives in a peaceful and respectful environment. For most of you, violence is something that may seem a little bit remote, something that you may not have dealt with yet, that's probably not part of your immediate reality. But for others, the degree of conflicts and violence are matters that have to do with our daily lives, a reality that challenges every single day, but also threatens us every single day. Around 1,800 million youth around the world lies the responsibility to guarantee a life that it's worth living for the present and the future generations. You, the youth, you are our most precious active to make the Universal Declaration Rights an efficient and an alive tool. We must work hand in hand so that we can make effective the so-called 26 article in our declaration to ensure the right of every single, of every single human being to education. Education is the first requisite for freedom, democracy, and development. To a sustainable development, it is through freedom that we get to establish human conversations that can allow the reconnaissance of the dignity of every single being without distinction. Education is the one tool that would allow us to live in peace. Education has a transforming power that allows to create a tool so that we can reach a better society, a society that brings together justice, freedom, social certainty, and peace. You and I, all together, we all face the biggest challenges in our history, making sure that development and the future is based on the human being in our societies, in our environment. Don't forget that you too, as well, are being affected on the products that we have had and missed to have in the past. Humanity needs you. Humanity needs your freshness, your innovation. Youth education is the beginning, but also the main break in which our future lies. With the new experiences that you will bring about, we can definitely face better whatever challenges may come. We should never forget the big challenges that other people have faced, but also the ones that are about to come. Without you, we would never have the, the level of response that we could have in the future so that we can guarantee the promotion of the human rights, freedom and peace. This is why it is vital that we give you spaces so that you can get engaged and we should invest in you in this particular stage of your life. This is why I am happy that we have these summits like the one you organized from this outstanding organization. We definitely need you to bring closer the development index and to make it match with our sustainable goals. 
we definitely need your help so that we can implement the vulnerability level that we have and to bring it down. As youth delegates and youth ambassadors from different parts of the country and the world, you that you share the passion to promote human rights, you should take into account the 2030 agenda. It's a life agenda. It's something that we all need to push forward. Why? To make sure that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights keeps alive so that no one is ever left behind. Let's meet those 17 goals and those uh, 18 achievements that we need to get, as well as those indexes. So this is why I foster you to become promoters of our rights within our governments. You should exert your citizenship, become actors and not spectators. You have an unimaginable amount of challenges to come and you may not even know it yet. For instance, you may be exposed to violence, blackmail or any other danger that may come your way, lack of opportunity or maybe lack of opportunity in your professional field, but all of them go against human dignity and amongst them you may not have a job or maybe you, you may not have access to food or lack of educational services, lack of cultural and sporting activities, maybe some xenophobia through your speeches and many others. Maybe you're facing social inequality, maybe public policy that will not allow you to grow, for instance, the migratory problem that we're facing nowadays. But we should raise our voices so that our crisis may come to an end. Remember that migrants, before they were labeled as such, they're humans, just like us. Dignity is what makes us all the same race. This is why I foster you. Raise your voice. Let's look at the humanitarian side of migration. Between eight to ten young men that are fleeing their countries, for instance, for the Mediterranean, they are being exploited. Or 103 million people who lack basic education and can't read or write. And 60% 60 60 of them are women, boys and girls, who still have to face genital removal in Africa. We definitely need to put those practices to an end. They are aberrative and crazy. We should definitely abolish children marriage. In my country, Mexico, from 2010 to 2016, 8,600 women were murdered among kids and others. And up to 2017, we used to have millions of people who were gone missing. And a good percentage would be, sec would be on the sector of vulnerability. We cannot continue like this anymore. This is why we need to make out of the youth a safe stage to grow into. We definitely need to seize the tools that you have at your disposal. The new technologies and communication technologies definitely expand your outreach. Whenever a country is failing, you can always act either through collaboration or cooperation, but it will always be you. In Mexico, for instance, out of the 232 global indexes that we need to meet, only nine of them have a budget attained from government, and then the rest are being done by the civil society. So here, I foster you to find your opportunity here so that you can make it a reality. In the years to come, several generations will be brought together and we will be facing new challenges. Maybe us versus the, machi the machines or others. As of today, 4 million people don't get access to internet and 90% of those live in developing countries. On the way we face our economical crisis and protectionism in such a global economy, in certain parts of the world we should never forget that we need to revert all the working cycle that has exploited kids or former soldiers or any other modern forms of slavery. We can no longer allow unemployment between the youth, no more. 
The percentage of unemployment between you, it's too high, and we need to revert that. On the other hand, we need to create decent jobs so that no kid is left behind. We need to patch and we need to save all the mistakes that have been done in the past so that we can follow and bright into the future. If we were to wish for a future, we need to fight for it. We need to overcome the obstacles that may come our way so that we can have such future. Our challenge is big and complex. And our difficulties will only continue to grow if we don't do anything. This is why it's important we are here today. This is why it's important that you keep fostering the right to have freedom of expression to promote human rights. We all depend on you. You must be changing agents so that human rights become a reality and they continue to be real in the future. Personally, I believe society can no longer be indifferent toward abuses of power, towards violence or any other abuse. In order to fix this, we need to work towards attaining peace. Which one, which if we were to wish it was lasting, should be sustained and supported in a real commitment to maintain and achieve peace. That it should be done throughout society, the civil society and the government, so that all this can bring about values that are lasting values that will reject violence and will prevent conflicts so that we can address the root of our problems through dialogue and communication between individuals, groups, and states. All of these elements will eventually create, as per United Nations states, the culture of peace. All the issues that are regarded raising awareness are flourishing. You are an example of that. You are the example that your generation continues to, cha to take on challenges. And yet, we need to think that these challenges will always be there, but you want to move on and you want a future for you. Our problems continue to be in the structure, but, the, but our hearts continue to be strong. Personally, I have always embraced this mission as my own. First, when I graduated in my house, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, where I learned the value of solidarity, and which is the one that you exemplify the best, solidarity as a whole and as a group. Sometime later, I joined the team, a government group from Mr. Jorge Carpizo, a remarkable Mexican and who's under leadership we started in 1999 the adventure of founding the Mexico National Human Rights Institution. We definitely need to strengthen our cooperation. It's important that you live your commitment with every passion that it's on you. Wake up every morning thinking of the people who do not have the same opportunities as you. It's important that you renew your commitment every single day and that you look at your fellow man. Humanity is screaming for your help. We're counting on you. Do not feel alone. We are thousands of millions who every day fight shoulder to shoulder for a better world. The challenge is to be more human every day. I celebrate your life and your vocation. I invite you to continue forward with this endeavor. Thank you. Before you return to your chair, please stand here with me so that Antes de que se baña. Para todos los presentes, mi nombre es Shirley Villar, soy de México, Veracruz. En el momento, 
I am from Mexico, from Veracruz. The moment I began to work with human rights, with Youth for Human Rights International, I realized that I was joining a new family. This new family is created by idealists that, just like me, seek to protect human rights. I honestly wish that the new generation dream of becoming protectors and guarantors of peace and tolerance. I believe that our biggest challenge is lack of, sensitiv of sensitivity of the newest generation, which simply turns into apathy or indifference towards others. This is why in our team, our motto is not being different. We should not look the other way. We educate boys and girls on the importance of empathy because for us, the kind word given at the right time, a kindness act or an act of love can change someone's life around and hence we can change the world. Through several workshops and engagements with our community, we teach human rights to our boys and girls and we help them in building dreams around their, around their environment. But above all, we want the kids to feel their, their rights as real. Our biggest achievement is reflected in the face of hope of every single boy and girl that we have reached out. And they know now that they are not alone. Now they know that there are people like us that will go above and beyond to safeguard their human rights and that we will never give up. Thank you. And now, Karna. Ahora, el fundador desde Nepal nos va a dirigir unas palabras. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and honor to have an opportunity to participate in the 16th International Human Rights Summit as a co-sponsor. Cardinal's positive trust that been KPT was established three years ago, just only three years ago, to bring a positive thinking, positive awareness in the Nepalese society. For information, in my country, there are more than 90 associations we talk only about rights, but nobody talks about the responsibility. And this KPT is all about talking about responsibility with the right. We advocate the civic education and promote the power of positive thinking into society. Ladies and gentlemen, Nepal is naturally and culturally a very rich country. Just less than 1% of the earth size harbor more than 12% genetic diversity in the world. If we calculate the size of Nepal in terms of the, perhaps we are bigger than China and India. We have so much of genetic diversity. However, we are very poor in politically and socially and economically. We are not privileged at all. The country is passing through a very unstable ordeal of economic disruption and frustration. The Nepalese youth are confused and baffled by ongoing political and social restlessness. They are scummed to live in a very negative environment, thus compelling all our youth to seek their future in different parts of the world. Anxiety, skepticism, and pessimism reign so high. The youth often fight only for the right, but completely forget their duties. And that's the biggest problem in our country. Such irresponsible behavior instigate them to become more and more dependent. They knew what others have to do, but they don't know what I have to do, what they have to do. 
and that's the biggest problem. Therefore, KPT, Cardinal Positive Trust, its slogan is, let me see from other sides, let me hear from other ears, and let me think from other mind. And that is, to my mind, is one of the most important slogan of the society. We carry out nationwide awareness movement to encourage youth to explore the potential of Nepalese richness toward entrepreneurship. We give the class to entrepreneurship. We make to tell them how we can become a job a giver than job taker. We give regular motivational talk program for the potential entrepreneur so that they don't have to leave the country, the rich country. KPT has opened IT positive youths all over the country. The club conduct regular meetings where members talk only about positive thinking. No one is supposed to indulge in negative discourse, sub negative discourse, discourse and criticize others. The idea is to involve the youth in mindful, positive awareness and exercise. When Mary, Dr. Mary Sutherford came to attend the Kathmandu, to attend the Asia Summit in, in Kathmandu, we had a very constructive meeting. Actually, it was Mary, Mary, you gave me some kind of impression. And after that, we really worked very hard to talk, to balance the right and duties in, the, in our society. <clears throat> KPT have 200 trust bearers, we call them trust bearers, who go to every village and every school and talk about positive thinking. And we distribute quite a lot of booklets, which I have brought, but they are all in Nepali, so you will never understand them. And with all details about rights and duties to aware, just to become a citizen. The freedom of the real citizen is measured by the amount of responsibility which he must assume for his own welfare and security. We strongly believe that the civic society is complete, is incomplete without a right at the same time the responsibility. I'm very glad to inform the audience that KPT, the Coronal Positive Trust, is carrying a nationwide campaign approaching youth in the school and villages and convincing them that we can, we can have only right without full, we cannot have only right without fulfilling the responsibility. Since our aim and the human right, Mary, your organization's aim is very closer. We are honored to be associated with you. And in our country, we are doing lots of work in human rights at the same time, this responsibility. Finally, I'm glad to have had the opportunity to talk about our organization in this prestigious platform. I hope the summit will yield the great result for everyone of you. Thank you very much. And we are very happy to work together with you for a long time to go. Thank you. Dignitaries, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daphne Ribeiro from Toronto, Canada. We live in a great country where generally everyone is respected and we have the opportunity to educate ourselves on human rights. I am fortunate to not have personally suffered human rights violations and am fortunate, sorry, and started volunteering to share my good fortune with those who have suffered and also with those who have violated others' human rights by helping them understand the morals of our group and to create a better future for all. When I speak to fellow students and younger children, I get great joy in teaching them about human rights in easily understood ways. At our group events, I've often asked attendees, how many human rights do you have? Only to receive a baffled look. 
So we've created a petition for youth based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to teach everyone their 30 human rights and create awareness of when they are being infringed upon. We have a wheel of human rights to spin at our booth. I read them the th human right number that it lands on and give them a booklet describing all 30. Last week, our group participated in a walk for value through Toronto's downtown. Many children approach asking for books with in genuine interest. Children are enthusiastic about learning what their rights are. This prevents reason for schools to for the school system to implement the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into the curriculum. I've noticed children who have recently moved to Canada have real interest in their human rights. Many have seen violations and hence moved to Canada, but in a world where everyone understands and respects the human rights, we will be more united and become better citizens of the earth. Thank you, you know, thank you through Human Rights International. <laughs> Next is Syed Kazam Ali from Pakistan, who is the chairman of Human Rights Protection Committee, Lahore High Court Bar Association. Honorable President, Excellencies, Organizers, and my youth leaders from all over the world. Assalamu alaikum. I am a recipient of a great fortune to be able to speak on this forum. I, like my fellow members, could not agree more on the importance and advocacy of human rights at this time in the world. <clears throat> that is why youth for human rights is so important. My understanding of human rights and observation of human rights violations have transformed my experience of the world where I would like to imagine a diverse, equal, inclusive, and fair world for all the people. <clears throat> but the reality suggests otherwise. The land that I come from has made me witness the struggle the human lives have to go through. The unfair distribution of economic resources, social, cultural prejudice, the, and the sorry state of criminal justice in our society have irked me and shock my conscience. But respected members, this, had, this has not led me into the state of despair, but has brought motivation and encouragement to work for a better present and best future. I have served as a Chairman Human Rights Protection Committee, Lahore High Court Bar Association, and during my time, I have contributed to the education, the training of a number of young lawyers, member of civil society and pledge to continue so in the future. I would like to say that with all the issues mentioned above, we are still fighting as a state, have not given up and will not give up. As a state, we would like to play our part to leave a place full of resources like the Youth for Human Rights materials and the opportunities to our coming generations. The only way we can do this is through education for our human rights. Where there are oppressors, there are also liberators actively working towards social and economic independence. I would like to draw your attention to the credit of Lahore High Court Bar Association, which has 35,000 lawyers on its role and has played a pivotal role for restoration of democracy, independence of judiciary, supremacy of constitution and protection of human rights in the motherland. I feel honored that I am representing my community here in the Youth for Human Rights Summit. I would like to request each of you to use the material of Universal Declaration of Human Rights to serve the humanity to the best of your abilities, because I do believe that humanity is the religion of God. And we must contribute ourselves in this holy cause. As well as myself is concerned, I want to educate, help the needy litigants, and raise the voice of rights in my community. 
I am determined to work against the social and cultural biases against the minorities. My framework includes engaging with government officials, lawmakers, stakeholders, and civil society members in my pursuit to provide timely and effective justice to the marginalized group of the community. I would like to conclude with a commitment to come back in future with more success stories where we can all cherish and improve state of human rights. Last but not the least, I would like to thank you, dear President, for Youth for Human Rights. I must salute your services for providing this opportunity to all of us to talk, listen, think about human rights. Thank you so much. Honored ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be in your company at the Youth for Human Rights International Summit. I am Man Cristina Rothwell Guerra from Guatemala. Human rights are fundamental for all people, and I want to study them because it gives me the chance to touch lives. Living in Guatemala, I have seen firsthand countless violations on human rights. Seeing this inspired me to work to cement them. One of the ways I have done this is by volunteering for two different Techo camps. Techo is an organization that builds houses for people in need. The, hard, the hardest part about this was trying to break some of the preconceived ideas about the people living in these communities. But by the end of the camps, we were able to become very close to the families. I also participate as a volunteer for Youth for Human Rights Guatemala. In doing so, I have been a part of a program that has trained over 4,000 police officers and over 300 school principals. I have visited five different police stations and one school in Guatemala. I was able to learn about the challenges police officers face in their everyday work along with the rewarding moments. Although there was some pushback from the officers. First, because I'm only 17. And second, because human rights are not always well received in Guatemala. These experiences were very eye-opening. Through this, I learned about the current state of my home country. I made good friends along the way, decided what to study, and I realized there is a lot more I can do for the world in human rights. Thank you. And now joining us is Guillermo Escobar Roca, director of the University of Alcala in Spain. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Enhorabuena a la presidenta, a la asociación. Espero que que podamos pensar en la manera de colaborar con las universidades también. Bueno, hay un error, no soy el director de la Universidad de Alcalá, eso sería el rector, no, el rector, no, soy el, yo creo que estoy aquí invitado y agradezco mucho quizá también por la, por la amistad con el presidente de la Comisión de Hechos Humanos de México y con Raúl Arias también. Eh, estoy aquí quizás por, porque en la Universidad de Alcalá tenemos un proyecto de hace ya 20 años. We have been holding a project for over 20 years now that is aimed to the Ombudsman on Latin America. I just saw at the door a, a, a police vehicle that said professionalism, saying we need professionals. And I believe we have a great team with over 20 public officials in Latin America that need to be forming in this topic continuously. We definitely have good, some good professionals and some researchers, as we are bound to know what are the problems that our community is facing and how come human rights cannot be guaranteed. We need to study why, and we need to find some professionals. And maybe this is why I have been invited here. Close to here in Washington, January 11, 1994, the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 
delivered his very famous speech on the second Bill of Rights, where in essence he proposed incorporating social rights into the Constitution of the United States, a clear antecedent of the principles of interdependence and invisibility of human rights. Mr. Roosevelt concluded his speech back then like this. All these rights stand for security. And after we win this war, we must be willing to move towards new goals of human happiness and well-being. The right place for America and the world depends at large on the fact that these and similar rights are a reality for all of our citizens. Because while there is no security here or at home, there will be no lasting peace on earth. Four years later, these rights were incorporated largely thanks to Eleanor Roosevelt to the most memorable document in the history of humanity, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose objectives included freeing human beings from fear and misery. Seventy years later, this declaration has only been half fulfilled and millions of people are far from enjoying, as this declaration also did, a broader concept of freedom. History shows us that no right has been achieved without a struggle. The setbacks are also frequent. Even here in the United Nations in New York in 1966, we witnessed a certain step back when the rights were divided into two blocks limiting the system of individual claims for only one of them. The rights of 1948 were moral rights, although that does not diminish their value, and the 1966 rights are already legal rights. But you have to convince the judicial powers to apply them, to convince the legislators so that they can develop them, and convince the executives so that they get to respect them and protect them. We can and we must continue working on expanding the catalog of rights. For instance, with the environment, it's not yet recognized as a human right in international law. Always in a thoughtful and well-argued manner, not any demand is a human right. But before we can do so, we have to insist on the fulfillment, also universal compliance, of the 1948 rights. Putting the rights on the paper is the first step, but clearly it's not sufficient. We have to fight every day for, so that they can be fulfilled. And in this struggle, it belongs to all of us, and especially to you, the youth, each one with its capabilities and possibilities. How? Well, first, as Roosevelt said, and in our own country, we need to incorporate them into the Constitution. Human rights must become legal within each country, and at the highest level, the constitutional level, because the constituent power commands over the legislative and over the executive and judicial, which has already been achieved in almost the entire world. We have to work first to fight so that these rights act as obligatory, not just as mere policies. The approval of the Sustainable Development Goals is an interesting step, and especially because it allows us to measure our progress. But let's not fool ourselves. In 1966, it became clear that they were enforceable and not just desirable. And forgetting this key idea would imply a clear recoil. Second, outside of our borders, there are countries in the world where violations of human rights are very serious and there are problems that can only be solved at a global level. These solutions are very difficult without a global constitutionalism which is not expected in the, in the midterm. Now, we also have mechanisms to protect the rights that we can enforce from home. For instance, international cooperation, something that's enforceable, controlling transnational companies, or asylum. All those institutions must broaden there is spectrum, and we can definitely demand that from home.
if one right is not to be fulfilled in any specific case, the solution is slightly easier. And that's why we have courts and ombudsmen to whom we owe our support. Our struggle with the structure, or in general, is a lot more harder than the treaties itself. If I get to read all the agreements and the pacts from the United Nations, they definitely tackle this problem, this problem properly. As it has been laid out in several reports that we must disseminate. Structural problems require structural answers. For example, jail overpopulation. If there's a right that's not fulfilled, we will almost always find a gap on the importance of that right or a lack of sensitivity towards that right, specifically coming from the government. And sometimes by society, because in the unknowingness of, of such right, they cannot demand the execution of this right. This is why we need to change our mindset. Even though we get to have some punishments around the violations of these rights, it's obvious that we're not going to get to each one of them. For example, jail overpopulation, as I said, would only have a long-lasting solution until we get to convince all of them that those who are prisoners are also human and they're also entitled to every single right and they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and not the other way around. We need to strive for protecting the rights of the LGBTQ community. We need to have a global per change of perception on the way we regard these human beings. Therefore, the answer lies on a change of mentality. Definitely change the way we insert education on the syllabus of our governments and ministries of education. But a major change in education level, just looking back to an UNESCO report in 1973, which is basically forgotten, which shows that we should learn how to learn to think, to debacle, to become active citizens and not passive citizens, to take part in our global politics, to be part of the information and to respect all opinions and for a collective search of common well-being above our personal interests. The main problem of the world and the problem of human rights, it's unknowingness. Our struggle needs to begin with our mindsets. We need to raise awareness and we need to know who is the real enemy. Education on human rights? Well, yes. Well, first, education for those who violate human rights. Lack of culture, intolerance, if we don't identify who our enemy is, which will obviously be hiding from us and to these guys themselves, we won't make much progress. Thank you very much. And now, please welcome the president. Y ahora, al presidente de la Fundación Diáspora Africana, Agripa Esoso. Buenas tardes a todos. Antes que todo, me gustaría darle la bienvenida a todos a los Estados Unidos. Sé que todos vienen de diferentes rincones del mundo para poder hablar de derechos humanos, así que les agradezco infinitamente. Aplaudo su logro y estoy orgulloso de tenerlos. Segundo, para... All their hands today. You guys energize us to do what we have to do. As an adult, we owe it to you. Second, I thank all the speakers, my fellow speakers, thank you very much. Most importantly, my friend from, from Gambia, thank you. And all the you delegate from Uganda, from, from Guinea, I thank all of you. Uh, most importantly, all my African delegates who are here today, thank you, thank you. We have never forgotten about you. There are a lot of things that we are working on and hopefully you will take a note to go home. 
because we are going to visit every African country. Now, the culture of violence in our world continues to threaten our day-to-day -day existence. From every media, we read, listen, and see the grave result of indifference, intolerance, bigotry, and the quest for acquisition of land and resources. In each of the five regions in the African continent, there are instabilities, rogue regimes, proxy battles, all tantamount to human suffering. The year 2008 marks the sixth year since the ongoing carnage in the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. The same year marks the fifth anniversary of the chaos in Darfur, now we called Southern Sudan. While there are honorable mention of these calamities in, in every news, very little is being done to thwart these volatile aggressions. International organization, however, only seems to pacify the victims of these conflicts. But their efforts are short-lived. Proposing the solution, if we are to examine the ongoing battles in every region on the African continent and the world, we will find that a major cause of the uprising and the battle is lack of effective communication and education on our human rights. We will remiss if we are to discount the role of external impositions in this nation raft with conflicts. The culture of slavery, colonization, imperialism, and neo-colonization under the guise of a global market economy are impacting the factors that continue to threaten stability and economic development in Africa and most third world countries. This is because they lack the basic knowledge of our human rights. The ADF proposed this question. Is it possible to have stability and economic development without peace? Other pundits have countered by asking, is it possible to have peace without stability and economic development? The old adage seems appropriate here. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I want you to think about that. The ADF contention is absent peace, efforts of stability and economic development will be futile. To that end, the ADF launches the initiative to construct, establish, and maintain peace education using youth for human rights materials. Now, let me be myself, you know, for example. I'm speaking English to you today. Somebody taught me how to speak English in my country. Somebody taught some people how to speak Spanish in Africa. Portuguese. French. And all the whole continent of Africa, we don't even get along because we have been split apart. Now, when I look around, they did not teach us English in the bedroom, not in the plantation. They did it in the classroom. So today, I am appealing to each and every one of you in this room, join us for the fight to create a permanent peace and human rights curriculum once and for all. How do we do it? Let's talk to our leaders. Give us 1% of your military budget and put it to the classroom for peace and human rights. For that, Bob Mali once said, stand up, get up for your rights. I would like each and every one of you for here, please help me stand up for Mary Shorowat, stand up for human rights. Tunde, come over. Come and join me.
First of all, I want to thank every one of you here. I want to thank Mary Shuttleworth. I heard your voice before I met you. You are the voice of the voiceless. And thank you for actually giving all of us uh, an opportunity to express and echo what is in our heart. Human rights for all. We have all been victims. We've been refugees around the world. If you know this song, please join me. For those who have given up, we say, get up, stand up. Stand up for your rights. Don't let them hold you down. Get up, stand up. I say, don't give up the fight. Say, get up, stand up. Stand up for your rights. Don't let them kick you around. Get up, stand up. And I will never give up the fight. And I say, don't think about the fight. Thank you. Don't give up the fight. Mary? Okay, we have one final speaker and then we've got to get out of here. So let me please, to conclude the first day of the summit, I will now call up former UN Human Rights Education and Protection Advisor, former Ugandan diplomat in Africa and Europe, His Excellency, Ireneo Omositsan Namboka. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, Youth for Human Rights, international ambassadors and representatives, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. As you will agree with me, it isn't an easy task after the orators we've heard since morning up till now for me to come and say anything that will be of any special value. But because of my sister, the president of Youth for Human Rights International, asking me to come and say a word, allow me to say what I have to say, and you'll decide whether or not it's worth your time. <laughs> I'm going to say a very simple thing. Human rights is something that everybody talks about, but very few of us really grasp what the substance of human rights is. Sometimes we speak in complaining. Sometimes we speak in praise. This afternoon I'm proposing to you, as a conclusion to what we've been hearing since morning, and you can see the diversity of views, of celebrities, of courageous actions by people present here and some not here. I'm going to go with you through a few slides and I'll leave the interpretation to you. My focus is where did human rights as a notion come from? Human, each one in this house I believe is human regardless of where on the globe you originate from. So let's look at a few slides here and time allowing, maybe we shall have a word or two from yourselves. Here's the first slide. Okay, we call it the origins of human rights. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For me, that is the human race's single unifier. But where do these words come from? Let's look at the second slide. 
we all come from one origin and that skull is of my ancestors and the ancestor of each and everyone in this house let's see the next the Bantu for those who come from Africa central and southern Bantu means humans and they started from this red part of the African continent and spread to the rest of the world and they went as Bantu and took Ubuntu that means humanness wherever they went the next slide please and so you have in the human creation something that all beings have on my left hand side but you're right from that angle is the mother and the affection it shows to its baby to my right and to your left is a mother doing something not very different let's see the next slide the oldest human societies and humanity Ubuntu let me try to read it first various words have been used to describe the presence of humanness or Ubuntu sympathy compassion benevolence solidarity hospitality generosity sharing openness affirming available kindness caring harmony interdependence obedience collectivity and consensus yes we've heard these things in culture in politics in songs but below is the opposite of what that humanity would be you have vengeance opposite confront opposite to confrontation opposite to retribution and Ubuntu <coughs> values life dignity compassion all these are negated if you go away from the first lot of words move to the next slide please right mother motherhood mama some other people may use other words mère maman it does not matter the baby from any part of the world will cry the same way here is Ubuntu it started as I said from that continent and to this day you'll find this spirit of Ubuntu the mother is feeding the baby and working so that the baby can feed but the joy the mother enjoys feels is more than the baby itself that is receiving that's a message I'd like to deliver at the end of this the giver deriving more pleasure than the recipient let's go to the next slide please yes it doesn't have to be an African mother my earlier picture was some chimpanzee and some human <laughs> but here it's just mothers an African mother an Indian mother an American mother an Eskimo mother will be so delighted to feel that somebody is taking from her the milk the baby doesn't have to be conscious of the gift the mother is so happy the next slide please uh -huh. aha <laughs> I'm talking about mothers here <laughs> <laughs> the next photo please next slide please uh -huh. it is indifferent once in your human it's the same I'm trying honorable lady and gentlemen there is the lady here we have the same denominator the common denominator humanness it doesn't matter the laws you put in place it doesn't matter what God you pray to you are human and if we focus on this we are moving in the same direction the next photo please did you not skip something can someone please tell him to go back to the microphone please here we are meeting for the first time these people have been all over the world and they were here some years ago 
and the job is to try and multiply and multiply and encourage and push and cajole. Next, please. Now, this is a diagram which shows to the left the most primitive, if you like the word, the real and spoiled society constitutes the bigger part of the circle. The pre-Columbian Amerindians, the Africans, and the Asian Far East and Aboriginals. They're the two ones I'm talking about. Tend to belong to what would be the old and fashionable way of looking at things. Now, the small part up to the northeast is a culture that is slightly removed from that primitivity. It's a bit more sophisticated. And we might lose the old humanness and counting on the rule we put in place. You can, because the, the uh, translators cannot. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the interpreters, but those who heard may have heard. <laughs> those who didn't hear, God bless you. <laughs> the next slide, please. Now, throughout much of history, people acquired rights and responsibilities through their membership in a group, a family, indigenous nation, religion, class, community, or state. Most societies have had traditions similar to the golden rule of do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's a very old saying. Do to me as you'd want me do to you. The Pharaohic Egyptians, the Hindu Vedas, the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, the Bible, the Quran, and the anecdotes of Confucius are six of the oldest written sources which address questions of people's duties, rights, and responsibilities. You might want to say, and again I come back to this red continent I showed you, there was a man in 12... 1,235 called Sundiata Keita, who promulgated the Kurkan Fuga demanding charter, which is very comparable to the Magna Carta in the United Kingdom. You can see how far behind. This has a reason. Some of us who have been administered by people from other continents think they imposed on us the notion of human rights. I'm saying human rights as, are as old as the first human being on earth. They didn't come by colonizers. We were born with them. The day you see the sun, your human rights are with you. Give me the next slide, please. These are traces of how far long, long ago human rights were being expressed. Look at the Ma'at or Ma'at, which refers to the ancient Egyptian concepts of truth, balance, order, harmony, law, morality, and justice. You could tr compare this with Ubuntu. I know that today there are people that I saw come from countries that speak Bantu languages. Ubuntu means humanness. And the philosophy, the central message of Ubuntu is harmony, law, morality, and justice, and order, and truthfulness. It's those things that make you a human being, not what is written or not written. The next, please. Well, this goes back. <laughs> That was an absolutely incredible conclusion today's first day of the summit. Tomorrow we will be here. Registration begins at 9, but the summit begins at 10, unlike today, which began at 11. So please mark that. We begin promptly at 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock a.m. for registration. Thank you very much. With the same passes, you'll keep your same passes. Please don't lose them. You cannot get in without them. Enjoy your night in New York, and we will see you all back here tomorrow morning. One more thing. We're also going to be in this same room, no matter what you've heard. Otherwise, we're back here in this same room tomorrow morning as well. Thank you and good night.